It's uh, lovely to see so many game developers in one place. Quite rare, isn't it? Um, as game developers, uh, one of the things that we like achieving in our workflow is speed and quality. One of the things that can really help with achieving a good result quickly is in-house tooling and plugins. Um, our guest, which is coming up to give us a talk, um, Sander Van Hove is going to tell us about his in-house plugins and tooling that he's using and how that can benefit our workflows as well. So please, welcome Sander. Awesome, thank you so much. So yeah, like uh, Christoph said, I'm going to present in-house uh, plugins and tooling that we are using at Koira and also maybe give some inspiration to you uh, and how you could speed up your development process with them. Um, but first, who is this guy? Well, I'm Sander Van Hove. Uh, I released once a little mobile puzzler using Godot. Um, but at the moment, I'm the lead developer at Studio Tolima. Which I'll come back uh, to in, the, in one of the next slides. Uh, and currently, I'm also writing a book on learning Godot and uh, GDScript for, beginner, for beginners. Um, but you can also know me as the guy who makes uh, games in the uh, model bleep in GeoDOT. Um, so, who is Studio Tolima? What are we doing? So, we're a Belgian based uh, uh, indie studio. Uh, you can see over there the photo of, uh, of our little studio of uh, all the people, and one of them is here in the room, I think. Uh, there he is. <laughs> it's Frank. Um, and we're, at the moment, we're making our first game. It's called Koira, and uh, it's a little story about you saving a little dog and then going on a big adventure, learning to work together. Uh, and of course, yes, you can pet the dog. You can even feed him. You can play with him. Uh, it's really around the relationship with the dog. Uh, and yeah. So we're also published by Don't Not. Then, what will this talk be about? Uh, it will not be about how to create games. Um, tools are really all uh, in the background, so the user doesn't really see them. Uh, we're also not going to directly uh, change the source code of Godot itself. Uh, we're going to keep it uh, surface level so you can make uh, things quickly. And will also not be a tutorial, of course. Uh, but uh, what I want to give you is an overview of the possible things you can do with tools, uh, explore uh, ways to make development faster, uh, and of course, hopefully, inspire you a little bit for your next tool. So, talking points. The intro, which you already achieved. Well done. You get a star. Um, next, we'll do uh, why in-house tooling, and then we'll do the iceberg of in-house tooling, where we go from uh, surface level, like uh, in-game tools, to editor tools, editor plugins, uh, C++ and GD extensions, and then at the end, uh, external scripting. Sounds good? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, why in-house tooling at all? Uh, of course, Godot was not made for your game specifically. Sorry to tell it to you. Uh, Godot is pretty, uh, pretty generic. It wants to uh, be able to make a lot of different games. Uh, and that's a good thing, that we should celebrate that. Um, but that means that you could invest in tools for yourself to speed up your workflow and your process uh, while making your game. Uh, and of course, when the tool is done, you can share it with, some, with other people and uh, make Godot more for that kind of game. So, what things do we want to do? We want to automate. So, on the other hand, on one hand, you have like the classical developer, and I found like this stock image of a, of a programmer. I don't know who it is, uh, <laughs> but this this person is very proud of his technical capabilities. He loves to like. Uh, over complexify stuff like abstractions on abstractions and likes to spend like hours um, automating something that he can, could have actually done in like 10 minutes. Um, and he also rewrites code like seven times. And then you have a manager who is like, hey, I, want, I, I wanted that result. And uh, they love optimizing visible progress and doesn't want developers spending hours on uh, automating things that could have been done in 10 minutes. Uh, and of course, both of those things are not wrong to want. Uh, that's a lot of fun. But what we could strive for is to be Giga Developer. <laughs> <laughs> and this person knows which tasks to, will uh, gain them uh, more time when they automate them, which tools would uh, help them out in the long run. Um, and we'll do certain things by hand if that's needed, if it's uh, never going to uh, come up again. 
and is in general a very cool person, like you would expect. <laughs> so, what problems are actually automatable, right? Um, and I made a little list of uh, highly automatable tasks. So the first one is things that are that you need to repeat often, like for example, if you're debugging your game uh, or you're running your game and you want to know where the player is, maybe it's a good idea to have a tool uh, that reports that somewhere. Uh, things that take a long time, like before, uh, for example, making builds, especially if you're making builds for a lot of platforms. Uh, maybe you want to just press a button and go away from your computer instead of like pressing multiple buttons. Um, things that are uh, prone to human error, like for example, validating scenes. Uh, you want to be able to uh, look at a scene and see at a glance, like, okay, this will work or this will not work. Uh, things that are time sensitive, like for example, maybe you want to make a build every Friday evening and want to be home at dinner uh, that evening, like in time. And of course, the last thing is things that make you feel like well, not very good. Uh, things that are boring, things that are mind-numbing, things that are frustrating or just hard to remember. Like, for example, if you ever uh, pushed a lot of builds to the Steam backend, like the, <laughs> the Steam backend is not a fun place to be. Um, you want to automate that in some way. Uh, and so the rule of thumb is um, that the implementation of your tool should gain you time. So uh, the automation uh, implementation should uh, take less time than Pro, uh, pragmatically doing the thing over and over again over the time of your development process. All right, let's dive into the tool making uh, iceberg. Uh, and the first one up is in game tools. So, in game tools are actually just plain scenes, right? Um, you can do a lot with Godot. Godot is very, um, uh, very powerful, very flexi uh, flexible, and very uh, versatile. So, don't you don't need to start off with very complex things. You can just uh, make new tech with the uh, or use the old tech to make new tools uh, for your game uh, by, for example, creating scenes, creating menus, creating uh, all these little tidbits um, just from within the editor, and then run them as if they were your game. For example, oh, is it running? Ah, uh, no. Oh no, <laughs> so I'll portray what was uh, supposed to be shown here. Um, so uh, what we have in Koira is like a debug menu. Uh, you probably maybe have already seen these in other uh, games as well. It's uh, like a nice um, window with all the values. It says like value uh, plus uh, the name of the value, maybe a category, stuff like that. Uh, and then we also have a, a series of buttons. Uh, and the cool thing about this little in-game tool is that you can just use these commands. For example, if you want a button, you say, hey, debug menu, I want the button. Uh, it will be called unblock the player, um, connect it to me, and use this function to, to, to do that. Um, so this way you can very easily add buttons, add debug functionality. Um, it's also very contextual. For example, if the player is not in the scene, then this button is not added to uh, the debug menu. Um, next to that, uh, you can also just, in one line of code, uh, add items, uh, add values, for example, the position of the player, uh, and you say, hey, this is the position. Um, of course, you can also do other things in a menu like this. Uh, we also have, for example, teleporting, that you can teleport your player, or uh, speeding up the, the, the runtime of the game itself, um, because there is a way to speed up uh, how fast Godot runs. And that's very, very handy <laughs> to get somewhere very fast. OK. Next. Another tool that we uh, created was uh, one to refactor, because at some point we wanted to use FMOD. Um, but our whole game was full of good audio notes, like audio stream player to these. And we had to find these, which is not easy if you just go scene by scene. Um, just so I wrote just a little script uh, that at the start of a level would scan the whole scene tree, look at all the nodes, say, hey, this is a, an audio stream 2D. Uh, this should be refactored. Uh, and it would also scan all of the scripts of all of the nodes because, yes, we uh, had a little system, of course, on top of the nodes as well to uh, instantiate and, and call them. So we had to also scan all of the scripts. And this is very powerful because else you need to really go scene by scene. And this is also 
like this gives you a, a live list of all the things that need to be refactored um, in the scenes that you're using. So you're never going to refactor something that's, for example, uh, dead code, like zombie code somewhere um, on the site. Then I'm going to give an example from another game. <laughs> uh, this is the puzzle game I was talking about. Um, you can also do, for example, level editors um, in something like this. Like here, um, my puzzle was all around uh, hexagon grids uh, and Godot 3.2 didn't have any plugins or any capabilities at that time to do hexagon grids. So I just made a level editor in there. Um, and it's not cool. It's not, it doesn't look nice, but it works and it does its thing and that's uh, all you need uh, in the end. So then you can ask like, hey, but if, I, if my game is full of all of these uh, tools that are uh, in there, how do I like screen them off from the player? Because I don't want the player to open up a debug menu. Well, that's why our, uh, Godot has flags or feature tags, uh, because every uh, build in Godot, like if you export something or if you run it in the editor or you uh, run it in uh, on a Mac or on a Windows, they all get different tags along with the, that runtime. And you can check for those and then just have a look like, oh, is my uh, game running from the editor? Okay, then I just pump all the debug stuff in there uh, and else I'll leave them out. And so uh, some of these useful flags are, of course, the editor uh, flag, uh, which is uh, added when you run the game from the editor, uh, the debug one if you're running a debug build, uh, and the release one if you're running a release build. And one of the things where we use this in Koira is, for example, um, the, starting player, the starting positions of the uh, characters, um, because, of course, you have... Uh, we have huge levels, and sometimes you don't want to run through the whole level. You just say, hey, player, start there. Uh, do your thing uh, from there. Um, and that's very handy, but then you export the game, and you see that all these starting positions are all over the place. So we have actually two starting positions, uh, one for uh, when you run in the editor. That's, those are the first ones, starting location player, and um, some that are only used when we're exporting the game. And now you could say, hey, Sander, that's a pretty lousy tool. <laughs> but this is very uh, prone to human error and very annoying if you send a build to your publisher and your publisher is like, hey, why, why do I start in the middle of the level? And then you want this lousy tool to uh, catch your ass or save your ass. <laughs> exactly. All right, then we go one level deeper. We're going to dip our toes in the water a bit. And also drink a bit of water. So, uh, in editor tools, um, the the first obvious one is of course the tool uh, annotation, which you can put on the top of a script, and then when uh, you open that uh, or a note or a scene where uh, a, where there is this uh, a note with this script, um, it will be run in the editor. So everything that's in the script will be, uh, or that node will be treated as if it's instanced in a game, for example, and will run uh, at that moment. And so uh, it will, for example, uh, run the lifecycle functions like ready, process, um, handle input, handle uh, whatever it's doing, uh, and then is able to change the scene, change values, change uh, everything on the fly, and then you can save that and, uh, uh, yeah, have a little tool like that, and it's very nice. Um, this is ideal for content generation. I'll uh, show that in a bit. Uh, and also previewing mechanics. For example, if you have a player that's able to jump, um, and this jump is, for example, variable from level to level, then maybe you want to visualize the jump height uh, from level to level to be sure, OK, the game design or the level design um, reflects what the player is able to do and is not like you don't have to go in there every time and play the level but you can already make a good guess but it's also a very tricky annotation to use in your script because you have to watch out a little bit it's not it's very easy to accidentally remove things from your scene uh, and if you remove things from your scene in the editor uh, then it's also removed if you save it so then you may accidentally mess up your scene um, by doing this. Uh, it could also change values and by this uh, misconfigure your scene uh, without you 
like if you're not paying attention uh, without you knowing. Um, and it can also crash the editor if you're doing weird things. <laughs> So watch out. Make sure that you that your code works. Like uh, run it a few times, maybe in just in the game or uh, in a normal runtime, and make sure that uh, everything does what it's supposed to do before you accidentally remove things. Um, and by that, we we'll go to an example in Koira. So in Koira, we have these characters which are nicely animated. They're frame by frame animations. Um, but we split them up because we want to be able to mix and match um, the, anim the body part animations with each other. Like for example, uh, we want the player to be able to stand still and walk, but still do the wave animation, for example. And this wave animation should be generic enough to uh, fit the standing and the walking. And to do this, we split up the player in a bunch of uh, animation players. Um, and these animation players, of course, have to be synchronized because else they don't uh, show the right animation. Maybe the walk is out of sync, the, the, the eyes uh, are out of sync or whatever. And for that, we use a tool, um, a tool annotated tool, which uh, coordinates all of this uh, and makes it uh, happen. So here on the right, you can see that you can go from idle to walk, walk. And I think that's uh, five different animation players that are um, used at the same time. Um, and of course, yeah, we use this tool to be able to uh, preview these animations within the editor and not having to run the game the whole time. Cool. Then, like I said, random environment generation or content generation. Um, so you can use tool to, for example, uh, all the way on the left, uh, just spawn a different bunch of different scenes. Um, so you can, on the left, we just have like uh, a bunch of trees. You say, uh, this is the radius in which I want the trees to spawn, make something. Um, and then if you're happy, you can lock the generation of this content. So it's like that forever. Um, we also do this with fences, for example, where you can um, nicely draw a path and then it will put posts, it will connect these posts and make the whole, um, the whole collision as well. And you can also do this with other scenes, like, for example, the flowers here on the right. Next. Now, sometimes um, you make these tools, and you want to make sure that people use them correctly. Uh, and for that, you could use uh, configuration warnings, uh, which is also a feature in uh, Godot, um, where uh, you just show this little uh, yellow triangle next to your nodes to say, hey, something is off. You probably already have seen this with uh, area to these before you added the uh, collision shape to the, uh, of course. Um, and it, it's very easy. You just use the get configuration warning. And if you return a string, there's something wrong. If you don't return a string, then it's OK. And if it's updated, you just do update configuration warning. We don't use this, use this in Cora yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to introduce it. Then you could also make your tool easier to use with uh, advanced exports. They're exactly the same as normal uh, exported variables, but cooler. Because now, when you, when you export variables, um, you do export var and the name of your variable, and it will automatically be exported. Uh, the, the editor will be like, OK, I'll take this. This is my list of uh, properties. But you can also just provide your own list of properties. And uh, the, the editor will run with that as well. And uh, when you do that, you can also change this list. So if something changes, for example, um, on the top on line 149, there is like should change center uh, variable. Um, and if it's true, then on 145, uh, we add two other properties, for example. Uh, and, other, and else they don't get added. So uh, an example is we use camera settings. Uh, overrides, which override the camera settings so we can zoom out, zoom in, stuff like that. And you can see that uh, if I en enable uh, override zoom, then there's a little toggle that you can select the zoom. And you can also directly see like the preview of how which uh, size of um, area will be covered by the camera. And in general, it, this is very easy to make sure that only the things uh, get shown to the user that the user can use or so that they don't get overwhelmed, so they get uh, onboarded better, and things like that. Cool. 
Now we go to the editor plugins where it gets really interesting. So, editor plugins. Um, basically, um, editor plugins can be uh, can register new nodes or can extend the editor with new functionality, with new windows, with new uh, things, uh, and you can do all of this just with uh, GDScript. Now, for reg registering new nodes, uh, it's not necessarily to do a plugin for that. You can do that, but you can also just copy paste like the scene and the and the script, right? Um, Plugins are made to share, so uh, they are self-contained uh, and not project-specific, so that you can just uh, give your plugin to somebody else if you want. Um, and if I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you can make like a little uh, plugin um, configuration file that's there on the top. Just say what name it is, the description, uh, some other metadata, and on the bottom you say what uh, script should be run, and this script should be an editor plugin, like here, which has an enter tree and an exit tree, um, and these two should just, the enter tree should uh, initialize the plugin, and the exit tree, of course, clean up everything. And those are basically the things that are on the asset lib, of course, or that you can find on GitHub, um, which is pretty cool. I cannot help it, every time I see the, this to-do, I think like Godo, Todo, Maybe that's just my brain. <laughs> so in Coira, we uh, made a little plugin for FPS counting. Uh, it's here on the bottom. Um, so uh, that we can see uh, dynamically what the FPS is in each scene. Um, and uh, we wanted to make it very uh, generic so we can like carry it over from project to project. And it's now online. And I've already seen other people like use it, which is pretty cool. Um, and this plugin helped because, um, well, you don't always want to go through the like the monitor in the uh, in the Godot editor. You just want to see like while you're playing the game, like ah, there were some uh, frame drops here, and you can see that it's like kind of struggling there at the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then another interesting one that we created was um, for short keys. So Godot already comes with a lot of shortcuts and short keys, which are pretty interesting. Um, but we wanted to do more. Um, and so uh, with an editor plugin that uh, runs as a tool, which most of them do, um, you can intercept inputs and unhandled inputs. Uh, and then you can uh, like uh, check for, for keys that are pressed and overload those, which, for example, uh, locating a note at the mo mouse position, which you can see on the left, uh, which is very handy, like not in this case, but it's very handy if you want to grab a node that's like way off screen, like tens of thousands of pixels off screen, and you just want it here now, uh, then you can use uh, something like that. Uh, another one that we have is toggling visibility directly. We just have the H key, press H, and it um, like hides or unhides uh, nodes. Uh, and then one that's very, very handy if you have big scene trees, and that's selecting the parent of a node. Um, so we are still using Godot 3.5, um, and I've already heard that some of these are implemented in uh, 4. Uh, but for us, like, uh, it helped a lot. And you can see here like, how we go through the tree through, uh, to every parent. And the first, like, how I actually got into editor plugins myself was because I was tired of copy-pasting code from project to project. <laughs> like, I used to do uh, a game jam a month, and I, after some time, you accumulate like some scripts and, and notes. And at some point, I was like, I'm tired of copy-pasting them. I'm going to upload them so I can just download them every time, uh, so that I could uh, upload them to the asset store. Which was, yeah, that was a good solution for me. Then you can also, uh, like I said, add windows or, or different dockers uh, to your uh, to the editor. Um, just any UI uh, script or any UI scene that's uh, derived from the control node, you can add uh, pretty much everywhere or anywhere in the in the editor. Um, so, for example, like there's a list, but I also have a visual representation. You can uh, put stuff in the main screen over there. You can put stuff in the bottom screen over there, put stuff there in the Docker. I think you get the idea. 
<laughs> you can put stuff in different containers, which are all over the place. These are not like these. These are not exhaustive. These four arrows. There are way more containers, and we use that um, to make a plugin, a map cutter plugin, which basically makes uh, nav meshes dynamically. And so you can see on the left, there's just like a scene of a. Um, of a control node, a UI scene, and on the right, it's put into the bottom panel. And what this plugin uh, solved is the fact that our levels are huge. Like this part is, um, I think, 20,000 pixels just in, in, in width, and the level still goes like to here or somewhere. I don't know. Um, and so for us, generating nav meshes is a big problem because uh, it doesn't, you can't do it automatically um, and some of our um, and yeah I don't know like is, are there people who don't know what nav meshes are <laughs> I could like they they are used to navigate from point A to point B um, and you have to like define them yourself there are these uh, green areas um, and of course you don't want uh, an agent to navigate through uh, a solid body, so you have to draw around these solid bodies to this around these uh, static objects. Um, and the problem with our scenes is some of them are uh, 21,000 nodes big or even bigger, um, and they are huge. So we had a, we needed a way to uh, automate this, uh, and we basically did that in this plugin, which uh, saves us months of development. Cool. Then there's also uh, inspector plugins, which we don't use. <laughs> but but uh, this is basically like I had to take the picture from the Godot documentation. Um, so an inspector plugin is basically you have the inspector, and there you can, for example, have these Boolean selections, or you can select a number. But you can also make your own widget that uh, transforms this data. Um, like I've not seen this in a lot of plugins. If you ha know a good use case then please tell me in the Q&A section in the bit. Uh, it would be cool. But it's good that they're there. Like, at least you have the option, like, if you want to have a specific um, thing over there, then that is a possibility. Then you can also hack Godot's UI, which is a lot of fun. Because, fun fact, Godot, the editor, is made in Godot in scenes and notes. So everything you see is a note in a scene tree, and you can access all of them all of the time. So the the handy dandy uh, plugin that I told you about, <laughs> that basically always selects the parent, can keep on going even if you hit the root node of that scene. So here you can see that I'm going through nodes that are called at at 500, and at some point you get at the root node of the of the editor, and you can do whatever with the viewport, right? I can v-flip it, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, basically you can get to any node, to any location in the editor if you really wanted to. Um, and what I use this for is to uh, add a um, a button which is called play and memorize. And basically what it does is it uh, plays and memorizes the current scene. Uh, if you're then editing a different scene and you press this button, it will play the memorized scene, which is super, super handy dandy because, like I said earlier, some of the scenes are 20,000 nodes big. And if you have to switch back, press F6, it takes like uh, 20 seconds to just do that switch. And this button helps us a lot. And how I did that was just scan through the whole editor scene tree to find the play button and then put my button there. But <laughs> while, do, while preparing this talk, <laughs> I uh, learned that actually this, the adding to containers, would have uh, made it a lot easier. <laughs> but still, I mean, you can do it. You can, you can scan the whole editor tree. And then, of course, you can do shenanigans like this. <laughs> <laughs> Where you basically annoy your colleagues with spiders when they, when they go from their computer uh, too long. Uh, and. Uh, to all the colleagues who I scared, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. And then you have to like shoot them away, of course, before you can get, get back to work. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's hacking the, 
the Godot editor itself. Then we go to C++ and uh, GD extensions. Now, to be honest, I've not worked with uh, these a lot. Um, so, GD, like C++ and GD extensions can do everything that GD script plugins can do, but faster. Uh, although GD script has never been a bottleneck for us yet, uh, and uh, we're, we have a pretty big project, and it can do it even a little bit more. Like um, uh, GD extensions can bind shared libraries like DLLs, um, DLL files, and uh, whatever these files are called on Mac or on Linux. Um, but they're not faster or easier to implement. Uh, like a GD, GD script plugin is way easier to implement, way faster. Like the, the feedback loop of uh, like writing some code, testing it out, is way shorter and way faster to, uh, yeah, to create. Um, we are using uh, some uh, uh, C++ modules, uh, which Miguel actually helped on uh, for uh, FMOD. Then we went into the code as well uh, to extend it a little bit, um, but for the rest we, don't, we didn't make our own C++ or uh, GD modules. Then we can go to external scripting because uh, Godot has a CLI uh, tool as well, so you can just uh, run and or there are some functionalities from the Godot engine that you can. Uh, like a colon in the CLI, um, which makes it uh, easy to automate things uh, or Godot related things without having to open up Godot. Uh, for example, doing exports, uh, exporting release or debug builds, uh, very useful. Um, running a debug server as well. Um, we don't do a multiplayer game, but uh, I, I would want to be able to automate that instead of having to uh, run Godot the whole time. And then one that's interesting is that you can run a script just uh, like this, um, which is cool. Like I think if GDScript is the only uh, language you know, then go ahead, do it. So uh, like I said earlier, um, how we use uh, CLI in Koira is uh, with the automated exporting, um, especially because uh, Koira is pretty big to export. Um, it's, uh, it takes a few minutes, like uh, I think five uh, to uh, six minutes to do one export. You don't want to be sitting there like press one button, wait five minutes, press the next button. Uh, we just want to press one button and then wait until all the exports are done. Um, and that script would look a little bit like this. And yeah, that's, that's a task that's pretty boring and prone to human error. All right. Looks like I actually blew through my presentation, but more lurks. <laughs> There's always more to extend and more uh, to tool uh, around your game. Um, so always be vigil, always be on the lookout for the next tool that might help you win some time, might lower your frustration uh, in doing re repetitive uh, things. Um, this is just a start um, and yeah. Thank you so much for listening. So, I think we have quite some time for, for questions. All right, first question. Yeah, it's not really a question, but you asked for suggestions on good uses of editor inspector plugin, and I have one. Um, yes, using please. it for shader inspector plugins is really useful. Shader and inspector plugins. I've used it in the VRM and Mtune shader, if you want to see an example of it. Um, but one of the really nice things about editor inspector plugin is you don't have to use get property list. You can hide and show fields just in code in the inspector plugin. So it's worth considering if you use, have that use case a lot. And of course, you can do editor shenanigans like move fields around in the inspector side by side or whatever you want, so. Okay, awesome, thank you so much, yeah. Coming. And please, yeah, if you wanna show that to me after the presentation, then that would be awesome. Hello, I have two questions. The first one is uh, with the editor flag, or for like um, playing the game. Um, is debug flag, does it also work on the editor when I like launch the game? Yeah, so the debug okay. flag is always present when uh, when you do a debug build, of course, and when you run from the editor, yeah. 
Okay, and the second question is, uh, I don't use C-sharp on uh, Godot, but many do, and I want to ask if, is there a possibility to make tools for, with C-sharp and Godot? That's a good question. I don't use uh, C-sharp as well, to be honest. I can maybe Somebody answer that. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> However um, I find that it sometimes doesn't reload correctly, and then it tr fails to unload the assembly for some reason, and then you have to restart your editor when you change your plugin. Yeah, I, I don't know why it happens exactly, otherwise I would have filed a bug report already. <laughs> there, are several cases where, there are several cases where it's known to fail, and those are existing bug reports for me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> this one is a bit more I, personal, not really regarding the the generic side of making tools, but did you happen to create a tool that actually was equivalent to writing, spending one hour making a tool for optimizing something that took 10 minutes for Coira, for example? So if I wasted time? Yes, <laughs> if you happen to, <laughs> if you happen um, to have uh, miscalculated. That's a good question. I didn't prepare failures <laughs> for this talk. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it a little bit and uh, I'll try to get back to you because like right out of the top of my head I don't, uh, I don't remember anything now. Uh, I got another use case for a in inspector plugin for you. Um, in the new Godot 4 version of the GDX uh, of FMOD you actually can select your event, your FMOD event with a pop-up and that pop-up actually is created through an ins inspector plugin, so you don't have to like guess your event path any longer in the Godot 4 version of it. Ah, awesome! Yeah, I saw that in the the new FMOD version uh, of plugin version. I was so jealous, <laughs> but it's good to know that's uh, that's an uh, an inspector plugin. Yeah, cool. I'm a huge fan of uh, editor plugins. Um, so I guess my question is. Um, what is the decision making at your team? When do you decide, okay, let's actually make an editor plugin? That's a good question. Uh, it's mostly me being enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> so if I see, like, for example, um, a lot of the plugins or the tools we we use, like this one, yeah, it's it's actually on the library, <laughs> like the asset library. It's called Spook Dot. <laughs> Um, so if we go back to this one, for example, um, the difference for us is, um, so one, if I see like, oh, I could use this in my personal projects, then I will make um, a, a plugin out of it, an editor plugin out of it, and, and then use it for myself as well. But if I can see like this is so generic, for example, here making this, uh, these nav meshes, this is so generic, this is not at all project bound, then that's the moment we think like, okay, let's make it a plugin. Uh, another one is um, actually these uh, short, these keyboard shortcuts because they need to be loaded uh, as a plugin to be able to always uh, capture the input. Okay, I have a question. It's more like a global thing. So you said your project is on 3.5 version and you're not yet on 4th. Why? <laughs> That's a very good question. So we looked into porting it to 4, um, but of course games have uh, plannings, games have budgets, and porting it to 4 would, uh, would not have been supported by that budget. Um, plus, um, the, the things that we, or the reason why we would uh, port to 4 would actually not uh, support it this long investment. Uh, for example, it would mostly be uh, the new scripting um, and a little little better rendering. Um, but in the end, uh, putting like two or three months into that uh, might not have been like worth it uh, in the end. Hey, uh, you mentioned how Spooklet is in the asset library. Are there tools or extensions that, that you've created that you have not put on the asset library? And if so, what are the reasons for that? Yes, actually, like um, this one that I said was very generic and very useful. 
Um, so I didn't put it on the asset library, library because nobody, like, I posted about it a little bit and, and asked around and nobody was interested. <laughs> so nobody was like, wow, I need this tool right now. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, then, uh, then I, I don't put it on the asset library because maybe I'm just maintaining something that's not, um, that's not gonna be used by anyone. And that's not, like, that's not ideal. It is on GitHub though. Like if you really want it, you can go on GitHub and, and get it. Um, but yeah, it's not on the asset library. Thank you very much. Uh, what are some plugins that you didn't create that you use? Because I know that programmers always have the, oh, I need this now, I'm gonna make it myself, and then two weeks later you find out, oh, it exists already. Are there plugins that you use that you didn't create? Um, so if, if there were plugins that afterwards uh, I found actually uh, like implementations by somebody else? Or Just in general, which ones do you use? Just in general, which ones do you use that w somebody else made, basically, if oh, any? Yeah, yeah, sure. Like we use a, a bunch of plugins by other people. For example, the FMOD uh, uh, plugin, we use uh, SmartShape 2D, uh, on which uh, Rafa have, has a nice tutorial. Um, those are the ones on the top of my head. I think we also used a plugin for um, for better array and uh, dictionary inspectors. Oh, that's a good example of an uh, inspector plugin as well. Uh, <laughs> um, so we do use plugins as well um, from, from external people, uh, not just our own. Um, but yeah, this talk was mostly on, on making your own and motivating everyone. Yeah. Um, would you always recommend to publish your plugins, or did you also notice that it comes with a um, considerable maintenance burden that you should consider before doing the step? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, like I said earlier, sometimes if you don't want to be maintaining the plugin, um, you can maybe put it somewhere on GitHub or something else, or that's how I do it. Um, the, the right open source thing to do is, of course, open source everything, put it always on the asset library. Um, but yeah, that's, that's maybe more a personal uh, way of that you have to do for that. Did you notice any performance bottlenecks uh, when creating plugins? Or like, in general, like, uh, bottlenecks when creating plugins, so you couldn't really do what you wanted to do, uh, even when creating plugins? So if I would... If I noticed any bottlenecks while making pro plugins, uh, yeah, at some point uh, there were too many spiders. <laughs> <laughs> if you leave your computer on for like two hours, you go for lunch or whatever, then the, the, the whole screen would just be covered in spiders and you have to like scrub for 15 minutes. <laughs> Hello. Um, which tool would you say has saved you the most amount of time? And which tool would you say you wasted your time entirely and you thought it was going to be a home run, but then <laughs> no one used it or uh, it wasn't? Yeah. Oh. Um, so like I said, this one, um, I keep coming back to this one apparently. Um, so here, like, the thing is, automatically making these nav meshes is is insanely useful because uh, once you drag and drop like your uh, level a little bit, like you change it a little bit, you have to change all these uh, polygons and all these nodes. Um, and so this literally saved us months of development because uh, any change you have to go in there, uh, change it a little bit. Um, and that's maybe also uh, a crux of the nav mesh editor because you cannot select multiple uh, points within the polygon for example you have to do it polygon uh, point per point um, so this saved us a lot of time um, ones that didn't save time hmm. yeah maybe um, this one this memorize button it doesn't doesn't save that much time right it, it saves like 10 seconds per time you want to execute the scene 
that you memorized, but it's more like the frustration goes away of like, okay, I want to run this scene now, I want to debug this, and you switch and you have to wait 20 seconds or 10 seconds, and then you can press F6, and then you accidentally press F5, and you're like, man. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, it's me again. Um, have you worked with any tools or built any tools that handle um, like custom import settings? So, for example, your artist creates uh, a file and it's imported, and then rather than having to pre-warm it for your environment, you, it already does a bunch of processes that they usually have to do time and time again. So, I guess imp handling import data. No, we've not done that, but that's where uh, where uh, more lurks. <laughs> I have a short one. How often did you crash the editor with tool scripts? Oh, many, many times, many, many times. Like for example, the first time I did, uh, I did this, flipped the the thing, I accidentally moved my mouse. And I didn't know where the button was to flip it back. <laughs> so I was stuck there. And I was like, ah, I guess I'll have to restart the editor then. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of times. Yeah. Well, while we are on that, and since, as you mentioned, the editor itself is basically a Godot game, uh, did it ever happen to you to have a look to the source code to like maybe take some inspiration from there for your own plugin or things like that? Um, Mostly, I, I do look at the source code when I um, encounter strange behavior in, in notes or in code, and I'm like, why is this? And then I go through the, to the source code, and I'm like, ah, this makes sense. Um, but for plugins, uh, no, not necessarily. When you create these tools for your development processes, how important is it for you to document those tools also for other team members? Aha. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, I don't do it. That, that's, you, you, you found my Achilles heel. <laughs> I don't do a lot of documentation in general. Uh, and I know that, Fra that like Frank, the other guy I mentioned, um, he's always like, you have to document your code. And I'm like, no, code. <laughs> Code should be self-documentable. It's just like you should read the code and then you should know what it does uh, because comments become lies after you change something. Um, so yeah, not a lot. Okay. Maybe a, a very specific question is, do you know if it's possible to have some additional checks being done before you are building like a release game, so making sure that some parts in the scene are set correctly or so, if it's possible? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, I think that's maybe where, for example, this uh, script command could come in, where you first uh, write the script in GD script, which checks some scenes, or maybe uh, use an other plugin like... Um, What's the what's the unit test plugin for for Godot? Um, G units, yeah. Uh, or you you automate that in some way, and after that you do your exports or your builds. And you can also use uh, editor export plugins. So you can write plugins that run when you export. So you can do a shit ton of pre-processing of what, how you want the game to be exported. So there you can go. also make checks like, oh, did you forget to flip that variable that you use when debugging and then it will actually break your game because you didn't pay attention to it. Okay, awesome. That's again where it lurks, I guess. Uh, one more, maybe? Sorry. We have time. Um, have you guys tried to bring your game to Godot 4 yet? And did, it, did that work well for you? The, the converter? We, we tried, but it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it was a lot of work and it was, uh, uh, yeah, it, it would have, uh, we would have dedicated, uh, I think, at least two or three months uh, just doing that and it was not worth, for, uh, worth it for us. He, yeah, he asked if I had to port the plugins as well. Yes, 
of course, everything has to be uh, has to be ported to uh, Godot 4 because uh, some of the things are majorly changed uh, between the two versions. Uh, just for example, the uh, the annotations, right? The, the scripts, like tools, uh, export variables, like uh, add tool is now or was in 3.5 just tool. Um, exports were different. Uh, hello. If you are adding some widgets in, the, in your plugins, have you faced any limitations or you can really use everything that is in Godot Editor, like lists, uh, trees, and so on? You can really use everything. Just have to not be scared to break it. <laughs> okay. Um, hi. Good talk. Um, have you used any of the uh, gizmos in the editor for your uh, plugins? No, because uh, you mean like the 3D gizmos, for example? Yeah, 2D or 3D gizmos, yeah. Yeah, no, we've not uh, used those yet. Okay, thank you. All right, more questions? No? Well, thank you so much for, yeah, for listening, and uh, I was Sander. Thank <laughs> you.